Welcome, Welcome everyone to another good life. <laughs> oh wow, it's going to be a great good life. I'm telling you, you stay tuned to this program. She, oh, I gave it away, it's a woman. <laughs> she is going to bless you. Kay Arthur. Kay Arthur. <laughs> We were recently at the National Religious Broadcasters and we had a chance to interview her and yes. we thought you need to hear this too. Great Especially program. if you don't really know the Lord, you're just kind of fishing around, this will bless you. Precept yes. Ministries International. And also we've got Mr. Tony LeBron yes. singing, No Other Name Like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, Jesus, name above all names the, the one who reigns forever still the same we will praise the name no other name that's higher no other name that's stronger no other name forever i will praise No other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the name. We will worship and adore you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Praise the name. Praise the name. One who reigns forever, still the same. We will praise the name Jesus, name above all names. The the one who reigns forever, still the same. We will praise the name. No other name that's higher. No other name. No other name forever I will. I will praise the name, yeah. No other name can heal us. No other name can free us. No other name so precious. Let's praise the name. No other name that's higher, 
no other name that's stronger, no other name, forever I will. I will praise the name, no other name can heal us, no other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the name, no other name that's higher, no other name that's stronger, no other name forever I will. I will praise the name, no other name can heal us, no other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the name. That Tony LeBron <laughs> is a blessing. He's a worshiper. He is a great, great musician. We love Tony. You know, there are some great people, and there's some people that really love to worship God. And Tony is one of them. And we yes. appreciate it. Well, now we're going to K. Arthur. K. Arthur is at the National Religious Broadcasters with us, and she blessed Powerhouse. us. <laughs> and she's going to bless you right now. We're so glad to have K. Arthur with us. Yes, amen. She has been a trooper. I guess we'd call her a trooper for the Lord. Oh, amen. She has gone all over the world and is still at the age of 80, still going all over the world. She reminds me of Marilyn Hickey. <laughs> oh, Marilyn's a dear, isn't she? She's an amazing woman. She is, she is. Absolutely. And uh, we just love you and what you're doing. We do, Kay. We thank you so much for your ministry. You know, we want to talk about heaven today. I guess Good we're subject. all we're all closer yeah. to that day. Yeah. Yeah. And what is it you'd like to tell us about heaven? Well, first of all, I would like to say that we're all it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And uh, so we know that death is inevitable. In fact, I just finished writing, and it will be published this year. Uh, it'll come out, um, I think, in uh, April or May. Uh, and it's a 40-minute study on heaven, hell, and life after death. And, and the thing that I think so many of us don't stop and think about is there is life after death. And there's life after death, either in heaven, in the presence of God, or there's life in, uh, after death in hell, and eventually in the lake of fire where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. So it's appointed on us to die. So where are we going to go? And one of the things is uh, the only way that I can know that I'm going to go to heaven and have eternal life is do I possess Jesus Christ? Whether I'm a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a churchgoer, you know, whatever. If I don't have Jesus, if Christ is not in me, if the Holy Spirit's not inside of me, I'm not going to go to heaven. And, uh, and when you learn about heaven, I know, I, I would think that a lot of our viewers are thinking, you know, this life is hard. This life is painful. I mean, I cannot get over all the trauma that people are going through, all the suffering, all the hardship, all the fear uh, that people are, are facing, and the pain is so great. And, and so you think, is there anything, is it ever going to change? Well, it's going to change if you know Jesus Christ. He doesn't, he tells us in this life that it's given to us not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name's sake. But then he gives us this wonderful, wonderful understanding 
of, of what the new heaven and the new earth is like. And in Revelation 21, he says, then I saw the new heaven and the new earth coming down out of heaven from God, made ready, made ready. And that's what God wants us. I think he wants to use the program to make people ready made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And you know, it's very interesting because in Luke chapter 19, where it's talking leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes on his white horse and we come with him, you know, to earth, it says in Revelation 19, verse uh, six, the end of it, hallelujah. For the Lord our God reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Well, those of us that are living now that are part of the church are part of the bride of Christ. And in Revelation 20, it says we're made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And here it says it was given to her, to the church, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts, or King James says righteousnesses of the saints. So when that time comes, we need to be ready. And we're ready by the way that we live. And when you come to Revelation chapter 20, uh, he's describing it, and it says, And I heard a loud voice from the heavens saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling of God, is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now, can you just imagine? In the presence of Almighty God, we know that God passed Moses, but my, uh, he saw his back. We're going to see him face to face. And, and we're, uh, it's going to be good according to our righteousnesses. We've adorned ourselves. And, and you know, he tells them earlier in Revelation, now keep your clothes on. Don't, uh, don't let anybody take your good works away from you. You know, don't appear before him naked. And then it says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine? the hand of God touching you on the cheeks and wiping away every tear from your eyes. And then it goes on to say, and there will no longer be any death. The, the thing that Satan threatens us with, and, and I believe eventually the thing that if things don't change in America, if evangelical Christians do not get to the polls, if we do not vote for righteousness, if we do not stop being politically correct, I believe that there's going to be great suffering and great persecution from our own government. We see it now towards those, uh, we see a threat to our religious liberty. I mean, if people understood what's going on behind the scenes, their knees would really be knocking, you know, and, and so, when you look at this and it says uh, that he will dwell among them, there will no longer be any death. I believe eventually that we're going to be threatened with our lives. We work in 185 countries. We work in 70 languages. And our, a lot of our people are constantly facing death. When two of our team went into China, uh, they were sequestered in this building. They were shut in the building for uh, the two weeks that they were there. They never went out of that building. And uh, and uh, Diane and, and Bob were there, and they had lost their son. Their son had died. So they know the pain of death. They know the pain of losing a son. And so Diane is just has this wonderful mother heart. And, and she's saying, oh, I'm so concerned. You're, 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 you're liable to be caught. You know, they're liable to kill you. They looked at her and they said, we've already died. They already had laid down their lives. And of course, that's what Jesus calls us yes, to do. Yes. But now there's no longer any death. I think about Jesus in Luke 12, 
when he was preparing them for the persecution that was coming. And he said, now don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but be afraid of him who is able, he's speaking of, him, uh, of God, his father, who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. So uh, uh, death sends you someplace, you know, and so uh, we're to trust God and, and fear God. So then he goes on to say, there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. And the first things have passed away. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. And you know, then he goes on, and, and this is so comforting. He talks about who's outside of heaven. And it says, and, and I think this is so important. Of course, we're broadcasting at the NRB, at the National Religious yes. Broadcasters. And over and over and over again, what you've heard is uh, to be brave. You have heard that we are not to be cowardly, right? Yes. You have heard that we are to be courageous, you know. And it says this, it says, he, um, he who overcomes, and, and the victory that overcomes the world is your faith. And it says, will inherit these things, I will be as God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murders and immoral persons and sorcerers, and the word for sorcerers there is pharmakia, which is the use of drugs for magical purposes. And it says idolaters and all liars their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So one of the things that you can know, we're living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation right now in this life. People are mean, they're ugly. A lot of you have suffered verbal abuse. You've suffered emotional abuse. You've suffered sexual abuse. You have been treated like dirt and like scum. And, and, and that you have been reviled, you have been put down, you have been joked about, you have been kidded and, and, and in a mean way. All of that's going to go away because there ain't gonna be any mean, cruel people in heaven. That's you right. know, it's, it's going to be people that are, are belong to God. And more and more we're in this life. He's taking us through trials and everything to make us like Jesus. So this is what he's telling us about heaven. And then you can go on and you can read about it in Revelation 21 and 22. But I want to drop down to the end of Revelation 21. Is that all right? Do yes. we have time for this? No. Just okay, you interrupt 21. me. <laughs> go ahead. But in Revelation 21, 22, he's talking about the new heaven and the new earth and the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a bride, as we saw, adorned for her husband. And it says, and I saw no temple in it. And that is says, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Remember in the Old Testament, when they had the tabernacle and they would pack that up and move, when would they? how would they know to move it? Because there was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, which was the presence of God, the, the glory of God. Then when they had the temple, then that was over the Holy of Holies until in the book of Ezekiel, just before that Babylonian captivity, the glory of God departs. You know, and and so there's no temple. We know there's going to be a temple rebuilt there before Jesus comes. We know from the last chapters of Ezekiel that there's going to be another temple after Christ comes and where they're going to worship. But in the new heaven and the new earth, there's no temple. Why? Because we are in the very, you're in the very presence, the very presence of God the Father and God the Son, the Lamb, is there. And it says, and the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. 
he's the light of the world. You know, you go through John and, and he says, I am uh, the way, I am the truth, I am the light. I am the good shepherd. You know, I am the door. I am the By door. Me. If That's right. Enter in, By me. Safe. That's the only way yes. you can get in. You're so good. And and then he says, the nations will walk by its light. Kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, its gates will never be closed. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And listen to this. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination. Do you know that all of our sexual immorality, any sex outside of a man and a woman having sexual intercourse in the beauty and the confines of the marriage bed, all of that, anything that is not within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman, do you know it's an abomination to the Lord? And he's saying, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I think when we talk about heaven, what we need to talk about is, is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now that's you know, Revelation 22, and yes. I just read that too, kind of preparing for this. Yes. It said, and there was a, he saw a, a white throne Yes. and great white throne and him who sat on it yes. and the books were opened. Yes. Talk about the book, the yes. main book. In Revelation chapter 20, what he's doing is he's talking about the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes down to earth, he's going to rule and reign on the face of this earth for 1,000 years. Now, if, if you take this as Jesus' second coming, and you come over here to his first coming. So, so you make this kind of like a, a, a cross, okay? I don't know how to do that well for you, but anyway, this is the cross. So this is the first coming of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is crucified, why? Because the wages of sin is death. Because the soul that sinneth, it will die. Because sin is an abomination to God. And you cannot enter heaven if you have sin. So Jesus comes, he who knows no sin is made to be sin for you and me. God takes all of your sins and all of my sins and he places them upon Jesus. So then Jesus pays for your sins in full without the shedding of blood. There's no payment for your sins. So he pays for your sins in full. He's taken off the cross and he's buried. The third day he rises from the dead. And he's showing that his death, as 1 John 2 says, propitiated, satisfied the holiness of God. Your sins are paid for in full. There remains no more Hebrews 10, sacrifice for sin. It's all been paid. So the gospel is the good news that Christ on the cross, how did I make that cross? Died for your sins, and then he was buried, and then he was raised again from the dead, showing that he had conquered sin, so that now you can have forgiveness of sins. So Jesus, after all of that, spent 40 days with the, 12, uh, with the 11 apostles and, and teaching them things about the kingdom. So here's the first coming, this starts the last days, and then you have the second coming, and the day of the Lord happens just before then. So then what uh, Jane is talking about is she is talking about the great white throne judgment. So after Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years on the face of this earth, then a great white throne comes down out of heaven and, and God is sitting on the throne and it says, and the dead, not the Christians, but the dead, both small and great, will become out of hell, will come out of Hades and death and out of the sea and, and they will stand at the great white throne judgment and the books will be opened. And do you realize that there's a book on your life? 
Malachi talks Malachi, about a remembrance. Book remembrance. A book of remembrance, right. And, and so there are books. Those books are because God is always fair. God is always just. And so in when the books are open, one is the book of life. And those standing there, their names are not in the book of life. And But there are other books that tell what their deeds were. So then they are judged according to the things in the book. And then they are cast into the lake of fire where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. That's eternal suffering. That's eternal damnation. You know, do you want me to talk about that? I just want to say this. Yeah, but go God ahead. so loved the world yes. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, friend, you're a whosoever, but whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And yes, if your question was, people are asking, how can we get our name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Yeah. Is that what you were going to ask? Well, you were what tell I was them? going to, yeah, I'm so glad you told him because we opened the program saying there's either heaven or there is hell. And so what, what we have just explained at the great white throne judgment is these people standing there have already died and, and their destiny is already set. And they're not in the Lamb's book, those people are not in the Lamb's book of life because as James said, they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only way to God. And so when he died on that cross, he paid for your sins in full. Nobody has to go to hell. Nobody has to go to the lake of fire. First John 2, 2 says that Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the payment, the satisfaction for our sins. And not for our sins only, but listen carefully, for the sins of the whole world. So the reason anybody will ever go into the lake of fire, ever die and go to hell, and then stand at the great white throne judgment and then be cast into the lake of, fire, uh, lake of fire is because they have refused, they have refused to believe in Jesus Christ. And, you know, I think it's important for, for them to understand what it means to believe on Jesus. It is not an intellectual assent. It is a recognition 1 Corinthians 15 describes the good news of salvation. And it says that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to the Old Testament is what he's talking about. And what he's saying is this, that we're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of, the, uh, of God, the glory of God. All we like sheep have turned astray. We have uh, turned each one to our own way. Whatsoever is not of faith. If I, if if God says this is a sin, and and uh, and I don't treat it as a sin, and I say I'm going to do it anyway because it's my body and I can do abortion is a sin. Sex outside of marriage with anybody or anything is a sin. Uh, homosexuality is a sin. Lying is a sin. So he's telling us that Jesus paid for our sins, but we've got to know that we're sinners. We've got to know that we need a Savior. You know, I was, uh, I was 29 when I came to know Jesus Christ. By then I was married, I was divorced, I shook my fist in the face of God, and I said, to hell with you, God, I'm going to find someone to love me. And I went out and went against what I knew the Bible said, and I committed adultery. And I went from one man to another man to another man. I met a man and I fell in love with him. I didn't know he was married. When I found out, I didn't care. Then I found out that his wife was pregnant with her sixth child, and I still didn't care. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And then I began to feel guilty. And that guilt was coming from the Spirit of God. And I began to feel guilty, and so I said, I'll stop it, I'll be good. But the good 
I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And the evil I didn't want to do, I did. Maybe you're that way. Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's anger, maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's just plain meanness. And you don't want to be that way. And you know that it's wrong. And you try to do good. Precious one, you can't be good by yourself. You need to literally fall to your knees. And that's what I did. And I said, God, you're God. You can do anything you want with me. And there, July 16, 1963, at the age of 29, I was saved on my knees. And I got up absolutely changed. And, and I knew, I felt like I was a virgin again. I, I felt like I was clean. And, and, and then somebody brought me a Bible and I started reading it. And when I started reading it, it was like the veil. I, I had tried to read it before and I didn't understand it. But I didn't understand that when you come to know Jesus Christ, let's say my handkerchief represents the Holy Spirit. Well, when I come to know Jesus Christ, the Bible tells me I'm sealed with the Spirit of God. Uh, and then it tells me that I'm indwelt by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit comes inside of me. And when He comes inside of me, He never, ever leaves. And I have forgiveness of sins, and I am sealed, having heard the message, the gospel of your salvation, First, uh, Ephesians 2 says, having believed in your heart, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of your redemption. So wherever you are, whatever you've done, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All that matters is do you want to be free? Do you want to be forgiven? If you do, Jesus is saying to you now, Come to me, and I will forgive your sins. Come to me and tell me that you want me to be your Lord and your God. Come to me. I'm the Son of God. Believe it. Come to me. I'm the way to God. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Come to me. And those that come to me, he says, I will never cast you out. His arms are open wide, and those arms have nail prints in them, and they will have those nail prints for all eternity. And those nail prints are testimony of the fact, as Jane was saying, that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I guarantee you that when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, he gives you the... He's like the engine under the hood of a car. He gives you the power to walk and to live righteously. And he promises you that you will never, ever, in a sense, taste death because he tasted it for you. But the minute that you, the spirit leaves your body, your human spirit, you are absent from the body and present with the Lord and heaven is your destination. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. You know, God says he gives grace to the humble. Instead of getting angry, friend, because you know, I read that book, A Divine Revelation of Hell, and I'll never forget what the Lord said to Mary Catherine Baxter, he said, when he showed her hell, he said, many of these people are here because of pride. Pride. You know, the Bible says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. You know, sometimes when I'm out witnessing, I'll say, oh, I'll ask somebody their name and I'll say, can I ask you a question? If you're to die this very moment, do you know for sure you go to heaven? You know, many, most say, yeah, I'd go to heaven. And when I ask why, they say, because I'm a good person. Yeah. For in the Bible says there are none good, no, not one. All like sheep have gone astray. That's why Jesus came, because all of us, all of us, and we don't judge you. <laughs> we're told to love even our enemies, aren't we? Yes, God we're told love. to love our enemies. We just want you to go to heaven when you pass away. We want you to join us in heaven, because we're putting our hope 
all of our hope and trust in Jesus Christ. And I just want to ask you, go ahead, yeah. you're going to say something. No, I was just going to say, one of the things that you need to understand is that when you're truly saved, then it means that He's God and you're not. It means that, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. And it means that the Spirit's going to come in and, and change you into His image. But listen to me carefully. There are multitudes sitting in church that are going to go to hell. And that's because there is no change in their life. There is no power in their life. And Jesus said, if any man is going to come after me, if you're going to be a true Christian, deny yourself, take up your cross. It's death to your life, and it's his life now. And follow me. And, it, and, and it's so important. I would go to Luke. I, I would read the Gospel of John is what I would read. But I would also read in Luke where he talks about this. And read in Luke where he talks about hell and what it's like and, and the torment of it. And then they say at the end, oh, Father Abraham, send someone to tell them that there's really this place. And he says, listen, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they won't believe the Old Testament, then he says, though one rose from the dead, they would not believe. It's not, in a sense, the testimonies of other people that validate the Bible. The Bible has the answer. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Amen. Um, you know, I was watching you go through the Bible, and it's like second nature to you. Yes, it is. And I just wondered, can I buy that Bible? You know what? <laughs> you know what it is? It's an inductive study Bible, and it's not a typical study Bible where study is a noun. It's a verb here. And this Bible, the Inductive Study Bible, and they can get it by going to precept.org and, and go online, P-R-E-C-E-P-T dot O-R-G, and you can order it. And in, in the New American Standard or the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version, and it has instructions for taking apart every book of the Bible. It's non-denominational, doesn't have study notes in it. It teaches you how to study. And this is what we do all over the world. We teach people how to discover truth for themselves. Children, we have Discover for Yourself series for children. We have teens and we have adults and we have them in 70 languages so that they can study God's word for themselves. You've got to know the truth because many false doctors and te uh, doctrines and teachers and, and uh, evil men, corrupt men, as James says, uh, have snuck into the church and they're deceivers. And you can listen to Christian television and get all sorts of different varieties. You're not going to know truth if you don't know God's word. And Jesus prayed for you, Father, sanctify them, set them apart from, uh, uh, set them apart through thy truth, thy word is truth. That's what keeps you from the evil one. Mm -hmm. I just want to say in a minute, we're going to get you to pray. Okay. Uh, lead them in a sinner's prayer, if that's okay. But I just want to tell you, for those of you that think I can't live that life, you know, you can't live that life. None of us can live that life. But, you know, the Bible says, a new heart will I give you. This is when you receive Jesus into your heart. He says, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take that heart of stone out, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I will cause you to want to keep my judgments and do them. And that's the change. You know, everything changed. And here's my own testimony. The things I used to think I loved, the drinking, the partying, and everything that went with it, I no longer wanted to do. In fact, I just absolutely did not want to do it. The things I used to hate, I now love. And the things I used to love, I now hated. It was, it was crazy. But I was so happy. I was so in love with Jesus. Sometimes I couldn't go to sleep at night. I think, I didn't know you were real. I thought it was just religion. I didn't know it was, it was a relationship. relationship. Right. 
We mm-hmm. moved from a religion to a relationship. That's right. We, Amen. Yes. Well, and Ezekiel 36 mm-hmm. is that passage. Read it in your Bible where he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Just like you say, read it in Ezekiel 36. Yes. Now, we're, for those that say, I want yeah. Jesus and I want my name yeah. written in the Lamb's Book of Life, yeah. and they're saying I don't know how to pray, would you just lead yes. them in a prayer of repentance? Yes, and, yes. First of all, would you in faith tell God that you believe that Jesus is his son? That you believe that he is the way, the only way to God? And then we're going to ask him to save us. All right, let's pray. God, and you might want to pray these words after me. God, thank you for speaking to me today. Thank you for letting me know that you love me so much that you allowed your son to die in my place and to pay for my sins. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. God, I want to be your child. And I ask you now, in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to make me part of your forever family. Give me the gift of eternal life. And God, I will live for you by the power of your spirit as you teach me and take me by the hand and lead me step by step. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Now, may I study it, and may I live in the light of it. In Jesus' name. Listen very carefully. The Bible says that we believe in our heart, and that results in righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Go tell somebody else that you've just received forgiveness of sins by believing on Jesus Christ and that you've become a child of Almighty God. God bless. To contact Kay Arthur, please call Precept Ministries International at 1-800-763-8280 or send an email to info at precept.org. You can also connect with Kay Arthur at www.precept.org and on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm sure you've heard the saying, you are what you eat, and many can vouch that this is a very true statement. Proverbs 27, 19 talks about a similar comparison, which goes, as water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. And just like what you put inside your physical body reflects the body, what you put inside your spiritual body reflects the heart. Putting the Word of God daily inside of you and having that personal relationship with Him is key. The Bible talks about that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you speaking today? Play for all to see. You are love, you are love. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When fear is crippling, you are truth, you are truth. In my wandering, you are joy, you are joy. The reason that I sing, you are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. Oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to 
your embrace, light of the world forever. Rain. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here. Your presence I made whole. You are God, you are God of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Oh, nothing compares. Your embrace, O oh, light of the world, forever. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. Yeah. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus. I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough. Oh, nothing compares to your embrace, oh, light of the world forever. Running to your arms, running to your arms will always Hello, I am Terry Tripp, and this is Empower Minute. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. What is eternal life, and when does it begin? Well, according to Jesus, in John 17.3, He said, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Jesus said knowing God through a relationship with Him is eternal life. When does that begin? When you make the choice. Don't put it off another moment. Come to God just like you are and experience eternal, abundant life. Hey, I want to encourage you to support this network financially. They're reaching people all over the world. Well, it's time for We the People, a great segment. The more informed we are about our nation's Christian heritage and our freedoms, the better citizens we'll be. Here's Robert Evans with this week's edition of We the People. You hear so much about separating the church from the state these days that you would think it was part of our founding. It wasn't. That's a lie. It's actually just the opposite. Who do you think would know more about the intent of our founders? The men that were actually there or an activist judge or liberal talk show host of today? Let's ask the first 13 presidents of the United States what they think about separating the Bible from the government. They should have a pretty good idea of how our country was founded. 
Of course, we can't ask any of them because they're all gone, and that's how revisionists try to change the true history. Because of the men that were there can't stand up and refute them, so we're going to look at what they did and let their actions speak for themselves. What place does the Bible have in American government? According to our founders, a very special and important place. The very first act performed after being sworn into office by every single one of the first 13 presidents was to kiss the Bible. Yes, our first 13 presidents all kissed the Bible at their inauguration. Politicians of today might kiss a baby to try to get votes. Well, our founders unashamedly kissed the Bible as their very first action in office. Did the press of the day hurry and print stories about how they were violating the separation of church from the state? No, because the very thought of separating the Bible from the government went against everything that they stood for. Think about it. Every single one of the first 13 presidents kissed the Bible, including Thomas Jefferson. Those intolerant of Christianity today herald Jefferson as the author of separation, but they forget that he kissed the Bible at his inauguration. If he wanted to keep religion separate from government, then wouldn't he at least keep his lips separate from the Bible as his first governmental action? He didn't, he kissed the Bible. So did George Washington, John Adams, Andrew Jackson, and by the way, in case you were wondering, so did Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, and many more. Their actions provide more of our 1,000 proofs that separating Christianity from the government is an unconstitutional lie. Now, that's something to think about. Thank you, Robert. There is really nothing in this world will bless you more than having Robert give one of those reports. And Hear I'm sure truth. he does. And what do you think about? K. Arthur? <laughs> K. Arthur? Don't get me started. You know, this is the truth. I was just telling you earlier that I remember when she came to Montgomery, Alabama in the 80s, I remember what she talked about. That's how anointed this woman is. And of course, she cares about your soul, and we do too. And in, if you just joined us, we want you to know that Jesus loves you very much. And he wants to come into your life and make a difference in your life. You see, no one is ever the same, never, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, be your Lord and Savior, and you want to live for him the rest of your life. He makes himself so real to you, doesn't he, sweetheart? Amen. He did it for you, and he did it for me. I like to drink and party. We don't have the same testimony, but I'm telling you, Jesus took that desire away. I had no desire for that. All I wanted to do was read the Word, and that's what He did for you. Isn't that right, honey? Amen. And, you know, if you're watching and you've never accepted the Lord, this is your opportunity. That's right. If everything Kay Arthur said and the music and everything else on this program if it is tugging at your heart, then now's the time to just surrender to the Lord. Say, Lord, I love you. I want you to forgive me of my sin. I want to be born again by the precious Spirit of God. Amen. And that's all you have to do. That's right. Say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. We love you. God will do the supernatural, the miraculous. And now, Tony LeBron, restore me. think I'm all right. There's a smile on my face. Everything's okay. But on the inside, it's a different story. I'm stumbling down this road. I've got so far to go, and I'm a broken man. On my knees again, asking for a touch from you. Lord, I need your hand to restore me. Lord, I need your mercy. 
mercy. Take me to the place I used to be and use all the pain and all the hurt to do a greater work. And restore me. Yeah, you love me just the same. You told me I'd be free when I fell on my knees and cried. Renuevame, tu misericordia pido hoy. Llévame al lugar donde solía estar y usa este dolor. Para hacer, hacer tu voluntad, Lord, restore me, yeah. restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So I'll sing again the song you wrote for me. A clean heart, and I want a brand new start. Like the moment when I first believed, restore me, Lord. I need your mercy. Oh, take me to the place I used to be, and you. To do a greater way, Lord, restore me. We need you, Lord. We need you every day. Draw us close. Draw us closer. To 